Well, the week is chugging right along, isn't it? Um, won't be long before we'll be on fall break. I'm looking forward to it, sleeping in and having a cup of coffee and just getting to stay in a little longer into the house in the mornings. And I know you get to do that every day and you're looking forward to just getting up and doing whatever, whatever you want to do without any school assignments. And so I hope you enjoy your next week off because are you over it? <laughs> are you under, uh, under sleeping? Well, I'm just trying to be silly and use these two words here. We're going to start off today with some prefixes over and under. Those are both words, aren't they? They're actually a certain type of um, word that we're going to find out about later too, over and under. Um, and we'll learn more about that later. I'm not going to get into it right now, <laughs> but they're prefixes is what they are right now. And we can add over and under to the beginning of a word to change the meaning of it. Um, a prefix, we've talked about this before, is a word part added to the beginning of a base word that changes the meaning of the word. The prefix over means above or too much. The prefix under means below or not seen. So sometimes if I'm really hungry after school, I might overeat. What's that mean? It means I ate too much. Sometimes if I'm trying to lose weight, I might undereat. What means I eat eight, not enough, right? <laughs> so we can put over or under at the beginning of words to change their meaning. They can be, these words can be used as prefixes. So let's look at a couple examples here. And that's the one I said, overeat. You can overeat it means you ate too much or under plus ground is underground. That means it's below the ground. So over and under can be used as prefixes. Can you think of some other words that have over or under as a prefix? How about an overcoat? You put it over your other clothes, don't you? You might have some underwear. <laughs> you wear it under your other clothes. Yeah. Might be need some long underwear before long if it keeps getting cooler. All right. Over and under, they can be prefixes. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about point of view for a minute. I mentioned this the other day, uh, yesterday, I believe it was, and we said we'd talk about it more. So let's get into this. We're going to be, we've heard a little bit about this, but we've not really got into it really deeply yet. And so point of view is simply who's telling the story. Uh, in the first person point of view, and we, we, we call point of view first person or third person is all we're going to focus on right now. First person and third person. The first person point of view is the narrator is part of the story. So the person telling the story is in the story. Think about witches. Um, the little boy who was ta always talking about his grandmama and he's telling what's happening. It was a first person story. He was in the story and he was telling what's happening in the story. That's called first person point of view. A third person point of view is the narrator is outside of the story the narrator is not in the story and he's telling what's happening in the story, but he's not in the story or she's not in the story themselves. A story told in first person point of view has a character in the story as a narrator. Readers learn about other characters from what they say to the narrator. Third person point of view has an outside narrator. The narrator can tell readers what all of the characters are saying, doing and thinking. So we'll come back to this and we'll decide which point of view our story is written in that we're reading this week. But today, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to read our story together again. And so get your reading book out, open it to 214. My diary from here to there is what it's called. Remember, it's an autobiographical fiction. The author wrote this. The events actually happened in her life, but the people in the story are made up. And so it's not actually the author but it's a made up character. So we're going to read it together one more time today. And uh, this will be the last time we read it together this week. Tomorrow you're going to read it by yourself. So make sure you read this story. You'll have a test done on Friday as always. So here we go. My diary from here to there. Dear diary, I know I should be asleep already, but I just can't sleep. If I don't write all this down, I'll burst. Tonight, after my brothers, Mario, Victor, Hector, Raul, and Sergio, she's got five brothers, and I all climbed into bed, I overheard Mama and Papa whispering. 
they were talking about leaving our little house in Juarez, Mexico, where we've lived our whole lives and moving to Los Angeles in the United States. But why? How can I sleep knowing that we might leave Mexico forever? I'll have to get to the bottom of this tomorrow. Today at breakfast, Mama explained everything. She said, Papa's lost his job. There's no work here, no jobs at all. We know moving will be hard, but we want the best for all of you. Try to understand. I thought the boys would be upset, but instead they really got excited about moving to the States. The big stores in El Paso sell all kinds of toys. And they have escalators to ride. And the air smells like popcorn. Yum. Am I the only one who's scared of leaving our home, our beautiful country, and all the people we might never see again? So let's pause just a minute and talk about point of view again. What point of view is this story written in? Is the narrator, the person telling the story, in the story? Absolutely. Yeah, it's the, our gir the girl here that's writing in the diary. She's part of the story and she's telling what's happening in the story. Now, as we look at some words, we can look for words to give us clues. If we're reading a story and we find words that the narrator is saying, like, I, she's talking about herself. She's in the story. Okay. Or uh, if you, there's a bunch of I, if you hear words like uh, my, we, she's in the story that includes the author and the narrator and um, everybody else in the story. So there's some words that you can look for in stories to help you find if it's first person or third person. You can see on this page, she said I many times. That means I, she is in the story and she's telling the story. So this story is told in first person point of view. We'll read on. Okay, diary. Oh, I forgot a page. Sorry. My best friend Michi and I walked to the park today. We passed Don Nacho's corner store and the women at the tortilla shop their hands blurring like hummingbird wings as they work the dough over a griddle. At the park, we braided each other's hair and promised never to forget each other. We each picked out a smooth heart-shaped stone to remind us always of our friendship, of the little park, of Don Nacho and the tortilla shop. I've known Michi since we were little, and I don't think I'll ever find a friend like her in California. You're lucky your family will be together over there, Michi said. Her sisters and father work in the U.S. I can't imagine leaving anyone in our family behind. So, you know, her friend's trying to make her feel better. You know, I guess we can always think um, like the narrator here, like this girl who's writing in her diary. She's having a hard time. She's having to move away and leave her friend Michi. But, you know, the old saying goes, somebody always has things worse than you do. No matter how bad things are, you may think things are in your life. Somebody has it worse. Her friend Michi, sure, she gets to live in Mexico, but part of her family lives in the United States. So they're separated from each other. Her dad, she doesn't get to see her dad at all. And that's why she says, at least your family will all be together. So always remember somebody may have it worse than you. Okay, diary, here's the plan. In two weeks, we leave for my grandparents' house in Mexicali, right across the border from Calexico, California. We'll stay with them while Papa goes to Los Angeles to look for work. We can only take what will fit in the old car Papa borrowed. We're selling everything else. Meanwhile, the boys build cardboard box cities and act like nothing bothers them. Mama and Papa keep talking about all the opportunities we'll have in California. But what if we're not allowed to speak Spanish? What if I can't learn English? Will I ever see Michi again? And what if we never come back? Today, while we were packing, Papa pulled me inside, aside rather. He said, Amada, mi hija. I can see how worried you've been. Don't be scared. Everything will be all right. But how do you know what will happen to us? I said. He smiled. Meiha, I was born in Arizona in the States when I was six, not a big kid like you. My papa and mama moved our family back to Mexico. It was a big change, but we got through it. I know you can too. You are stronger than you think. I hope he's right. I still need to pack my special rock and you, diary, will leave tomorrow. Our, our trip was long and hard. At night, the desert was so cold we had to huddle together to keep warm. We drove right along the border across from New Mexico and Arizona. Mexico and the U.S. are two different countries, but they look exactly the same on both sides of the border. 
with giant saguaros pointing up at the pink orange sky and enormous clouds. I made a wish on the first star I saw. Soon there were too many stars in the sky to count. Our little house in Juarez already seemed so far away. We arrived in Mexicali late at night, and my grandparents, Nana and Tata, and all our aunts, aunts uncles, and the cousins, there must be 50 of them, welcomed us with a feast of tamales, beans, pan dulce, and hot chocolate with cinnamon sticks. It's so good to see them all. Everyone gathered around us and told stories late into the night. We played so much that the boys fell asleep before the last blanket was rolled out onto the floor. But diary, I can't sleep. I keep thinking about Papa leaving tomorrow. Have you ever had a big family get together? Maybe you're planning one for Thanksgiving and everybody's going to sit around and eat delicious food and tell stories and tell, talk about what's going on in their lives. It's always fun when families get together, especially like this family, when you have people you haven't seen in a long time. Papa left for Los Angeles this morning. Nana comforted Mama, saying that Papa is a U.S. citizen, so he won't have a problem getting our green cards from the U.S. government. Papa told us that we each need a green card to live in the States because we weren't born there. I can't believe Papa's gone. Tio Tito keeps trying to make us laugh instead of cry. Tio Raul lets me wear his special medalla. And Tio Chato even pulled a silver coin out of my ear. The boys try to copy his tricks, but coins just end up flying everywhere. They drive me nuts sometimes. But today, it feels good to laugh. We got a letter from Papa today. I'm pasting it into your pages, diary. My dear family, I've been picking grapes and strawberries in the field in Delano, 140 miles north of Los Angeles, saving money and always thinking of you. It's hard, tiring work. There's a man here in the fields named Cesar Chavez, who speaks of union, strikes, and boycotts. These new words hold the hope of better conditions for us farm workers. So far, getting your green cards has been difficult, for we're not the only family trying to start a new life here. Please be patient. It won't be long before we're all together again. Hugs and kisses, Papa. How about his letter? What point of view is it written in? See the word I, don't you? He's telling about himself, so... It's also written in first person point of view. I miss Papa so much. It feels like he's left ages ago. It's been tough to stay hopeful. So far, we've had to live in three different houses with some of Mama's sisters. First, the boys broke Tia Tuka's jewelry box and were so noisy she kicked us out. Then at Nana's house, they kept trying on Tia Nina's high heels and purses. Even Nana herself got mad when they used her pots and pans to make music. And they keep trying to read what I've written here and to hide my special rock. Tia Lupe finally took us in. But where will she? Where will we go if she decides she's had enough of us? Her brothers must be rowdy, huh? Finally, Papa sent our green cards. We're going to cross the border at last. He can't come for us, but will meet us in Los Angeles. The whole family is making a big farewell dinner for us tonight. Even after all the trouble the boys have caused, I think everyone's sad to see us go. Nana even gave me a new journal to write in for when I finish this one. She said, never forget who you are and where you are from. Keep your language and culture alive in your diary and in your heart. We leave this weekend and I'm so excited I can hardly write. My first time writing in the USA. We're in San Ysidro, California, waiting for the bus to Los Angeles. Crossing the border in Tijuana was crazy. Everyone was pushing and shoving. There were babies crying and people fighting to be first in line. We held hands the whole way. When we finally got across, Mario had only one shoe on and his hat had fallen off. I counted everyone and I still had five brothers. Whew. Papa is meeting us at the bus station in Los Angeles. It's been so long. I hope he recognizes us. What a long ride. One woman and her children got kicked off the bus when the immigration patrol boarded to check everyone's papers. Mama held Mario and our green cards close to her heart. Papa was waiting at the station just like he promised. We all jumped into his arms and laughed and Mama even cried a little. Papa's hugs felt so much better than when he left us in Mexicali. I wrote to Michi today. 
Dear Michi, I have stories for you. Papa found a job in a factory, and we're living in a creaky old house in El Monte, east of Los Angeles. It's not at all like Juarez. Yesterday, everything started shaking, and a huge roar was all around us. Airplanes right overhead. Sometimes freight trains rumble past our house, like little earthquakes. Every day, I hold my special rock, and I think about home, Mexico, and our walks to the park. Papa says we might go back for holidays in a year or two. Until then, write me. Missing you, Amada Irma. Well, diary, I finally found a place where I can sit and think and write. It may not be the little park in Juarez, but it's pretty. You know, just because I'm far away from Juarez and Michi and my family in Mexicali, it doesn't mean they're not here with me. They're inside my little rock. They're here in your pages and in the language that I speak. And they're in the memories and in my heart. Papa was right. I am stronger than I think. In Mexico, in the States, anywhere. P.S. I've almost filled this whole journal and can't wait to start on my new one. Maybe someday I'll even write a book about our journey. What do you think about this last P.S. here? It's kind of like foreshadowing, isn't it? Because the author we know did write a, write a book about her journey. So it's just kind of just playing around a little bit because this story is the story of the author's journey. It's an autobiographical fiction story. Okay. Well, um, we're going to move on now and uh, we're going to look at some more compound sentences, specifically using commas and compound sentences today. Don't forget to go and do your diary writing for today. Uh, do your diary writing for Wednesday. And then do the language assignment. And then I'll see you tomorrow. We'll look at our story again and a few more things. Practice our vocabulary and spelling a bit. So have a great day and we'll talk to you tomorrow.